Welcome to Nuclear Hot Seat, the weekly international news magazine keeping you up to date on all things nuclear from a different perspective. My name is Libby Halevi. I am the producer and host, as well as a survivor of the nuclear accident at Three Mile Island from just one mile away. So I know what can happen when those nuclear so-called experts get it wrong. This week, we celebrate the fifth anniversary of the start of Nuclear Hot Seat, five years of weekly programs on all aspects of the nuclear issue. We'll check in with just a few of the experts whose stories we've been covering over the years, including Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear, Mary Olson of Nuclear Information and Resource Service, Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center, Linda Seely of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace, Erica Gray of the Sierra Club, and Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest and Radcast.org. You'll also hopefully experience a laugh or two from a compilation of this year's best outtakes. And I have a very special announcement at the end of the show that just about has me jumping out of my skin in a good way when I learned it just yesterday. Here's a hint. It's got numbers in it. Plus, our ever-popular Numbnuts of the Week, Nuclear Reactor Duck, and Cover Report, and more honest nuclear information than I knew or even dreamed about five years ago. All of it coming up in just a few moments. Today is Tuesday, June 14, 2016, and here is the week's nuclear news from our perspective. Headlines only this week. The Environmental Protection Agency is pushing for a hike in radioactive contamination in drinking water. We'll hear more about this shortly from Mary Olson of NEARS. In Washington State, peace activists say that a patrol boat with the Washington County Sheriff's Office collided with their sailboat, some say it was rammed, while demonstrating against nuclear-powered vessels and trying to promote a nuclear-free world. Anti-nuke activist Mimi German of No Nukes Northwest and Harvey Wasserman of Solartopia were both on board at the time. We'll have a report from Mimi next week. In California, research shows that cases of thyroid cancer, especially in young women, are on the rise, and in some cities the rates are higher than the national average. San Francisco-adjacent counties hit worst, and there could be correlation with either the Fukushima radiation plume or radiation in the drinking water from uranium interacting with potassium nitrate. Duck! <laughs> and cover report. On June 12 at Millstone in Connecticut, a shutdown took place because of leakage from a reactor coolant pump, which then required a manual reactor trip, leaving the unit on hot standby. <laughs> And Exelon intends to apply for an additional 20-year extension to the operating license for Peach Bottom Reactors in Pennsylvania, bringing the operating period to 80 years. Yeah, duck! <coughs> and cover. In Japan, the Fukushima nuclear disaster has cost Japanese taxpayers almost $100 billion, despite government claims that Tokyo Electric Power is footing the bill. Yuck, yuck, yuck. Note that in the U.S., all we have in the kitty for a nuclear disaster is $13.4 billion. That's chump change. TEPCO's failed frozen wall around Fukushima Daiichi, a.k.a. the slushy, now needs to be injected with cement in order to slow the flow of the groundwater. Watch your food. Fukushima brand rice is going to be exported to London this summer. 20 tons of Fukushima peaches will be exported to Thailand this month. And shortfin mako shark steaks caught off Shizuoka Prefecture, more than 500 kilometers south of Fukushima, have 707 becquerels of cesium in them. Too toxic for Japan, but hey, acceptable in the United States. And now... Nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, nuclear hot seed, none not so. Japan's Environment Ministry on Tuesday, June 7th, drew up a basic plan to use soil contaminated with radioactive substances from the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear disaster to build roads. Part of the country's ongoing campaign to share the pain, meaning contaminate parts of the country that haven't been contaminated already. You know, Japan, 
I don't care how you jigger the numbers and spin the facts until they become a tissue of lies. This is part of an ongoing genocide you are committing against your own people. You are heinous, and whoever's behind this, it's too little to call you this week's Nuclear Hot Seed, none that sound a week. In Belgium, the Tehange 2 nuclear facility has been shut down after a motor failure, and neighboring countries, including Germany and Luxembourg, have called for the permanent closure of the aging, decaying reactor. Ya think? In India, a joint declaration between India and the United States is using a template promoted by international nuclear lobbyists to create what is being called a, quote, strong foundation for building U.S. imported nuclear power plants in India. In Britain, activists have blockaded a nuclear bomb factory for three days following reports that work is underway in secret at Britain's nuclear bomb factory to upgrade the existing Trident arsenal and develop an entirely new warhead. And in Ukraine, Chernobyl units 1 to 3 are now clear of damaged fuel only 30 years after the accident began. We'll have our interviews and special anniversary pieces coming up in just a few moments. But first, five years. Who'd have thunk it? If you had told me five years ago that I would still be doing this program every week, I doubt that I'd have started it. But it kind of crept up on me one week at a time, and I'm glad it did. Part of what has allowed me to keep going are the kind words and financial donations of you, the listeners. I have a deep appreciation for those of you who have chosen to help support the show, whether emotionally in your contact with me, through a one-time Starbucks gift donation, monthly recurring donation, or, on occasion, something larger. All of it counts towards knowing that the expenses of the show are being covered, as well as keeping me in good heart because it shows that you care about this show. As we move into year six, goals for Nuclear Hot Seat include increasing our social media presence and me attending the annual Excellence in Journalism Conference to be held this December in New Orleans. That's where I will have access to over 1,000 journalists, news directors, editors, broadcast print and satellite from mainstream media, all at the same time. As you can imagine, it's quite an opportunity. And also, as you might be able to imagine, the expenses to achieve this are beyond the ordinary. So if you'd like to celebrate the fifth anniversary of Nuclear Hot Seat and help launch us into a BAFO coming year and years, please help by donating now. Go to NuclearHotSeat.com, click on the big red Donate button, and know that whatever you can do to help the equivalent of a cup of Starbucks, or enough to cover my airfare. Know that it is deeply appreciated. I know how tough it can be sometimes, and I know what it takes for you to donate. From my heart to yours, I am truly grateful. To commemorate five years of Nuclear Hot Seat, we're revisiting some of the experts we've come to rely upon to get their input to current stories and point us to some of the ongoing problems. First, We hear from Don Hancock of Southwest Research and Information Center about the ongoing situation at the Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, or WIP, site near Carlsbad, New Mexico. The Waste Isolation Pilot Plant, WIP, in southeastern New Mexico is the only deep geologic repository that's operating, but it stopped operating and has been shut down since February of 2014 because of two separate events, a fire and a radiation release. The radiation release contaminated more than 8,000 linear feet of the underground mine. So since that time, the Department of Energy has been trying to get WIP reopened, and their first schedule was March of 2016. They missed that. Their current schedule is mid-December of 2016. 
They are well behind schedule. There are months behind schedule in terms of meeting the interim milestones to get to that reopening, but they want to continue to say publicly that they will get WIP reopened by December 2016. And the rationale for that is primarily because the Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz, leaves office on January 19th of 2017. And so the goal is to say that WIP has reopened on his watch. Unfortunately, as I mentioned, the mine is significantly contaminated. There is very inadequate ventilation for workers to be working in the underground, let alone handling nuclear waste in a contaminated environment in the underground. So I think it's doubtful that they will get reopened, but that still is what they're trying to do. In the meantime, people ask, quite appropriately, what's happening with the plutonium-contaminated waste from making nuclear bombs that's supposed to be coming to WIP, and the answer is it's staying where it is. Most of it is in the Idaho National Laboratory in Idaho, the Los Alamos National Laboratory in New Mexico, the Savannah River site in South Carolina, and the Oak Ridge National Lab in Tennessee. Those four sites were all hoping over these last two plus years to be shipping to WIP, and of course they haven't been, so they've needed to store their waste on site, and in the case of Idaho, continue to dig it up out of the ground, which they've continued to do, and to store it at the site. The fifth site that has a lot of this waste that hadn't been shipping to WIP before 2014 and was not scheduled to for a while is the Hanford site in Washington State. Hanford, of course, has bigger problems in terms of more amount and more radioactivity in their high-level waste tanks, so that's the focus and will continue to be the focus at Hanford for a number of years rather than trying to get waste ready to ship it to WIP. So the Department of Energy says to get back to full ventilation in the underground, which any mine needs adequate ventilation, is probably at least 2021, and that's unclear whether they can get it done then. Their idea is to try to say they've gotten it reopened for five years with handling only a relatively small amount of waste, but again, the underground's contaminated, the airflow is not adequate, so uh, a lot of us feel like it's premature and they shouldn't really be talking about getting it reopened in 2016 or in the near future. A story that I covered on last week's Nuclear Hot Seat is that the Savannah River site has been receiving waste, including high-level plutonium that is a shift from Japan. And they have 331 kilos of plutonium that just arrived. According to an article I read, Governor Nikki Haley has been protesting this new shipment coming in. She doesn't want it in her state. And Ernest Moniz said, according to this article, that, quote-unquote, a New Mexico facility that is slated to be up and running later this year, end quote, will be able to take the waste off her hands and that six metric tons of it will be coming in. It sounds like he's talking about WIP, and it sounds like what you're saying is ain't no way that's going to happen. So he is talking about WIP. He has previously said that this plutonium that you're talking about, including some that's just come in from Japan, can get repackaged at Savannah River so it can meet WIP requirements and come to WIP. Two things are wrong with that. One is, of course, it'll take a few years to repackage this waste at Savannah River to try to get it ready to come to WIP so it wouldn't actually happen right away, even if WIP were reopened. But as I say, that's doubtful. The other problem, particularly with this Japan waste and some of the other waste, it is illegal under existing law for it to come to WIP. WIP is for U.S. military defense plutonium-contaminated transuranic waste. Waste from Japan does not meet the category of U.S waste and it's not military waste. Japan, by definition, doesn't have nuclear bombs. So Japan's plutonium is commercial plutonium, which is explicitly under the law prohibited at WIP. Secretary Moniz sort of knows that, but he's trying to, in my view, make a political statement to the governor as opposed to dealing with the realities that at least 
some of this waste that he's talking about is clearly illegal and would clearly require changes in the law, which a lot of people would oppose. In addition, WIP is not going to be in any condition to take any significant amounts of waste from Savannah Riverside or any place else anytime soon. Don Hancock, our go-to person on WIP from Southwest Research and Information Center. Mary Olson, who is with Nuclear Information and Resource Service, or NEARS, weighs in on the complex issues of the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency, though Mary has some renaming and rebranding thoughts for that agency. Here she discusses the proposed change by the EPA in allowable radiation levels in our water. Hi, my name is Mary Olson. I work with Nuclear Information and Resource Service. I've had lots of titles, but I'm in the Southeast office, so I'm the Southeast Regional Coordinator. I'm really hot over the fact that we need to change the name from Environmental to Energy Corporation Protection Agency. This federal body has just put out informally and soon in the Federal Register a protective action guide that is going to allow the energy industry and its various affiliates to pollute our water with radioactivity and expose the general public like a hundred times higher than the current limits. Those limits are still going to be in place, but without any warning, without any notice, without any action, the amount of radioactivity in water can be literally more than 100 times higher than it is currently allowed. And in some cases, it's actually thousands of times higher for radionuclides that are associated with nuclear energy like cesium-137, strontium-90, and iodine-131. They are going through the roof. This protection action guide, which means if there's a dirty bomb or if there's an incident with a package and shipping or, let's say, high-level waste starts being moved around and there's a problem, or, you know, there's a meltdown, huh? You know, they're going to allow this. And it's not for just during the accident. It is for a period of time, possibly years, to be determined by the agency and the energy industry that they are protecting. And I want to go a step further and point out that this applies to every type of radioactivity because this agency governs all exposures to the public. And so fracking problems and coal ash that is radioactive and all other forms of pollution of water that could expose our bodies to ionizing radiation. And we know that this exposure has immediate consequences. I'm going to come back to that. But pointing out that it has long-term consequences because the latency period for things like cancer and fatal cancer can be years and even decades after this exposure that the environmental, no, the Energy Protection Agency is allowing. It's bad to have any exposure allowable. And currently, the standards say a number in millirems. Millirems can never be enforced, but it's only four millirems a year currently allowed in drinking water. And this protection action guide would take it up to 500 millirems a year allowed for a period of time without any notice, without any action. So this is really, really bad. And we're going to be mobilizing people through several sources. One, of course, will be Libby's nuclear hot seat that I'm speaking to you on. Another will be the NEARS Action Alert, and you can join the NEARS Action Alert for no cost at www.nirs.org. That is our alert list, and there's one to eight emails a month that allow you to take an action by pressing a link or making a phone call. We will be taking action to oppose this Obama administration. Excuse me, but it is an abomination it just is, and we all of us have to rise up and say, no, this is not good enough. And a third opportunity to learn more will be available sometime this week on Green World, the NEARS blog. It will have more details and links and information, and that is posted at safeenergy.org. One word, safeenergy.org. People have a right to know. 
People should be looking out on your own. People should be talking to each other and your own local officials who have to do with drinking water, telling them this is not good enough, asking them to get active with this issue, talking to your elected officials who are running for office, and just plain saying, hell no, this is not good enough. Mary Olson of NEARS, and she has promised me a much more thorough and in-depth interview on this very topic in the coming weeks. Kevin Camps is the nuclear waste watchdog, I prefer bulldog because that's what he is, with Beyond Nuclear. Kevin brings us up to speed on three separate issues, including the recent federal court ruling regarding on-site storage of radioactive waste from nuclear reactors. Hello, my name is Kevin Camps, and I serve as radioactive waste watchdog at Beyond Nuclear. And there are a few areas I'd like to address at the current crossroads in the battle against nuclear power and radioactive waste. One recent update that's very significant is a horrible ruling by the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals in Washington, D.C. at the federal level. This is the second highest court in the land. And just in the last week or so, that court, a three-judge panel, ruled against a coalition of environmental groups and states and an Indian tribe, Prairie Island Indian Community of Minnesota, in regards to the nuclear waste confidence challenge that we all had filed against the Nuclear Regulatory Commission. So what the court did was they said NRC's inaction on the risks of high-level radioactive waste storage pool fires and pool leaks the risk that a repository will never open in this country and the waste will just be stuck at the reactor sites or at parking lot dumps is just fine by the court because obviously the NRC would never let institutional control be lost on this surface storage. Well, it just flies in the face of reality because by definition, institutional control will be lost over time, whether it is 100 years from now or 500 years from now or 1,000 years from now. The waste is still going to be deadly and hazardous. In fact, it'll be deadly and hazardous for at least one million years. The Environmental Protection Agency has acknowledged that at Yucca Mountain. But truth be told, it's going to remain deadly for at least 157 million years in regards to the poison called iodine-129 that's in there. So it's just a nonsensical ruling. The court obviously did not take not only our arguments, but the state of New York, for example, the state of Vermont, who are parties to this lawsuit, did not take their arguments seriously. So our legal team, folks like Diane Curran in D.C. and Mindy Goldstein in Atlanta and Jeff Bettis at Natural Resources Defense Council, are trying to figure out next moves. But there will certainly be legal appeals that will take place from our side. But In addition to that, we will continue to resist the generation of high-level radioactive waste in the first place at the atomic reactors. And so that brings up the next point I'd like to make is some good news. There have been a record number of atomic reactor shutdowns in the United States in recent weeks. So just last week in Illinois, Exelon Nuclear, the biggest nuclear utility in the country, announced the closure dates for three reactors. Clinton, and also Quad Cities, Units 1 and 2. So for Clinton, it is a year from now, and for Quad Cities 1 and 2, it's two years from now. And they're going to try to wiggle out of that. They're going to try to get the state of Illinois ratepayers to bail them out. They've not given up yet, but but we're going to try to block that. Then earlier, about a month ago or so, the Fort Calhoun reactor in Nebraska announced closure probably this October, And so this string of shutdowns continues. There are many more atomic reactors in financial trouble. In fact, the Nuclear Energy Institute has acknowledged that 10 to 20 reactors are in serious financial trouble right now. So it's really time for folks to pile on and help to continue this uh, string of success to shut down these dirty, dangerous, and expensive atomic reactors. And the good news with a reactor shutdown is, by definition, once the nuclear fuel leaves the reactor core, you can't have a reactor meltdown anymore. But the risks continue in the form of the high-level radioactive waste that's already been generated. Those risks are oftentimes in the storage pool, where 75% of irradiated nuclear fuel is still stored in the U.S. 
But it even extends to the dry cask storage, where 25% of this overflow parking is taking place. That brings up the last point I want to make, and that is we are really facing a big radioactive waste battle in the United States in the form of what I call parking lot dumps, what the Department of Energy calls centralized interim storage sites. So in order to transfer the title and liability for the high-level radioactive waste, the Department of Energy is going around the country seeking consent for parking lot dumps. They're targeted right now at places like waste control specialists in West Texas, but then not far from there, you've got the waste isolation pilot plant in New Mexico. Both of those are top targets for this, but other targets include Native American reservations, which is a environmental injustice. It's radioactive racism. And then other Department of Energy sites like Savannah River site in South Carolina, even certain nuclear power plant sites like Dresden in Illinois are being targeted for these parking lot dumps. So already waste control specialists has applied to the Nuclear Regulatory Commission for a parking lot dump license. We've got to fight that. We've got to fight the Department of Energy's dog and pony shows across the country. We've got to fight legislation on Capitol Hill that would authorize and fund all this. And so we have some real fights ahead. If these parking lot dumps do open by 2021, which is the target date for them, then we would see unprecedented numbers of high-level radioactive waste shipments traveling by road, by rail, by waterway through most states. And these mobile Chernobyls will bring these risks from high-level radioactive waste through many communities. It won't just be the reactor host communities facing these risks anymore. So I encourage folks to jump into this fight. It's a good one. We've stopped uh, mobile Chernobyl many times, and we need to do it again. You can see what I'm talking about at Beyond Nuclear's website, which is www.beyondnuclear.org. You can email me at kevin at beyondnuclear.org and feel free to call me anytime at my cell phone number, which is 240-462-3216. A brave man to put his cell phone number out over the Internet, Kevin Camps of Beyond Nuclear. One of the troubling events of the recent past has been the coming online of the new Watts Bar nuclear reactor in Tennessee or at least the attempts at bringing the reactor online, which haven't exactly been successful. Erica Gray of the Sierra Club explains. Hi, this is Erica Gray in Richmond, Virginia, and I'm the nuclear watchdog for the Sierra Club. There's been a lot of talk here recently about what's going on with Watts Bar. More than four decades after construction began, the Watts Bar 2 reactor was finally connected to the grid on June 3rd. However, two days later, while operating at 12.5% power, the reactor automatically shut down. According to the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission, the NRC, the reactor tripped when a high-pressure turbine valve failed to open. Essentially, it shut down, was at 0%, and then a couple days later, it went to 3%, then to 12%, and then this past Friday, on June 10th, it was at 8%. So I guess we really don't know exactly what's going on because we haven't gotten an update from the NRC. What does this say about the reliability or dependability or desirability of getting this antique nuclear reactor up and running? I think it shows that it's not secure. I mean, I have no confidence. (laughs) (laughs) Well, that's a way to say it. I don't really have any confidence. I mean, how much confidence would most people have with the technology of, for example, a 50-year-old car? And is this kind of toing and froing in the startup process fairly typical for a nuclear reactor? Well, I think in the past it seems that they, you know, it's a trial and error kind of thing. So as they're starting up, we're going to probably see some little glitches. And I'm just hoping it's not like a big glitch. But we really won't know, and that's why everybody's kind of standing by and we're we're watching it. Is there any chance that these problems with connecting to the grid and powering up will reveal flaws so severe that Watts Bar will be forced to shut down before it even gets up to full power? That's very possible. 
And if this reactor can't seem to do it or has some other bigger failure, Lord forbid, it will definitely send a huge ripple throughout the whole industry in the United States for the few planned reactors that are on the drawing board. I'm just hoping that there's not a really bad glitch that puts people and the environment into harm's way. That was Erica Gray of the Sierra Club. Here in California, we've been working for decades to shut down the Diablo Canyon nuclear reactors, which were built within a quarter mile of major earthquake fault lines. Linda Seeley of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace brings us up to speed on a new strategy, one that promises to give our battle to shut it down more muscle than it's ever had before. This is Linda Seeley from San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace and the Sierra Club Nuclear Free Campaign. Thanks a lot for asking me to be on here today. I wanted to let you know about what's going on at Diablo Canyon. We are right now having a probably one of the most important months for our possibility of getting Diablo shut down for good. And here's how. The California State Lands Commission is meeting in Sacramento on June 28th at 10 a.m. And I think the only item on the agenda is Diablo Canyon. State Lands Commission leases public land, it's called the Tidelands, the area by the ocean, to PG&E. And these two leases are 40 years old, and they expire in 2018 and 2019. And our Lieutenant Governor, Gavin Newsom, is on the State Lands Commission. He, along with Betty Yee and Michael Cohen, those are the three commissioners, they are going to hear the recommendation of the staff on June 28th about whether or not to order a full CEQA environmental review of the project at Diablo Canyon. No environmental review of this nuclear power plant, the two reactors, and all of the surrounding development built on this pristine coastline has ever been done. And so if the State Lands Commission orders a full environmental review, they will have to take into account, the environmental review will have to take into account all of the environmental impacts that that plant makes on the environment which include the radioactive releases into the water, air, and land, the once-through cooling system that kills every single living organism that it takes in every day, two and a half billion gallons of water every 24 hours, the desalination plant that's in operation at Diablo Canyon, which has never had an EIR and dumps toxic chemicals 24-7 into the ocean, the heat that's caused by the operation of the nuclear power plants, even maybe we are hoping the health effects of the radiation on the people and non-humans that live close to Diablo Canyon. There are many, many other issues that can be raised during what's called the scoping period for the EIR, the Environmental Impact Report. And that's what we intend to do, raise all of these very lethal consequences of having a nuclear power plant here. So what we are encouraging people to do is to come to that State Lands Commission meeting, either in Sacramento, if people live closer to Sacramento, or here in Morro Bay, close to San Luis Obispo, where we're going to have a televised link to the meeting It's going to be on a big screen. It's a live link, and people will be able to make their comments. That starts at 10 a.m., but we are having a rally at 9 a.m. prior to the meeting, and it's at the Inn at Morro Bay. If you need more information about it, go to mothersforpeace.org, and we will be posting updates on there. We want to get a huge turnout for this meeting, both in Sacramento and in Morro Bay. We will have talking points available for people with the salient issues listed. And so it's bound to make a big difference. Linda Seeley of San Luis Obispo Mothers for Peace. In looking back over the past half decade of nuclear hot seats, many moments stand out for me. But two in particular deal with the problem of where to go if a nuclear catastrophe happens. 
As was put forward in Neville Shute's book and Stanley Kramer's movie based upon it, On the Beach, the Southern Hemisphere at least holds the illusion of greater safety than living north of the equator. With that in mind, I asked a pertinent question, tongue-in-cheek, at the end of my interview with Dr. Helen Caldicott on Nuclear Hot Seat number 83 from January 15, 2013. On behalf of activists around the world, if Fukushima goes south or there is a nuclear incident in the Ukraine that contaminates the Northern Hemisphere, how much room do you have on a living room couch for us to come and stay? <laughs> well, Australia is a huge place, and it's mostly all desert. It's not very compatible with life, but, you know, it's like Israel. You, you work out how to irrigate the desert. Maybe there's room down there for you. <laughs> <laughs> I just thought I'd check while I had you on the line. Dr. Helen Caldicott. Always nice to hear her laugh. I also asked a variant of this question of Kevin Hester of New Zealand on Nuclear Hot Seat number 233 from December 8, 2015. From Kevin, I got a very different kind of answer. Can you fill us in on New Zealand immigration policy and what it would take to get there before things go south? Yes, you just have to have millions of dollars. If you have truckloads of money, irrespective of your criminal history, you can buy your way into New Zealand. We've had lots of cases of people who have criminal convictions but tanks of money coming here and setting up businesses. Unfortunately, a whole lot of the stories that people have heard about New Zealand being clean and green and progressive, a lot of that now is, is history. So in other words... I should really put my immigration to New Zealand plans on hold until I've managed to rustle up a couple of million dollars. And get in the queue with all of the other thousands of millionaires and billionaires that are pouring in here. There's a lot of uber wealthy people coming here and buying up big stations, and uh, uh, sheep stations and charismatic properties all over the place. The migration of the uber wealthy who are running away from all these problems is underway. Kevin Hester from New Zealand, in case you couldn't tell by the accent. I'm still lobbying for space on his living room couch. Now, as is traditional on my anniversary shows, I like to present some of the moments that did not get on any show for reasons that will soon become apparent. I edit each week's interviews to take out any uhs, ums, stray mouth noises, stutters and ramp-ups, Skype glitches, and places where we simply step on each other's tongues. I like to think of it as audio decluttering. Here's just a tiny taste of the decluttering I did in the last year. Uh, um, you know, uh, it's... It so, so, so... Um... It, uh, we, 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 is, is, well, uh, you know, um, um, uh, uh, there's this really interesting trade off between Antioch, excuse me, um, I'll start over again. <laughs> I shouldn't be dr drinking Diet Coke, you know, <laughs> uh, uh, too much gas <clears throat> in, um, well, you know, um, <coughs> County, county, county. Um, 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 uh, um, 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 you know, like the ID you type in is D O E underscore F R D O C underscore zero 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 one dash three zero two zero. That last one turned into a link on the website. Of course, I'm as guilty as anyone of tripping over my tongue. You didn't think I'd get this slick delivery first time out of the box, did you? Here's just a taste of what you don't hear from me on the finished show. Helmholtz Radio <laughs> Helmholtz Radio <laughs> Where it continues to be brought down to earth and into our lives... By the jets, by bid, bid. When the Fukushima diet, bleh. the United Nations non proliferating This week, we continue our education on what's wrong with the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's consideration of the radiation denying hormosis, hormesis, horusis, 
As of last Friday, August, what the fuck was it? National co-optation by nuclear more. You've sold your soul and your future in order to be able to keep going back to your nuclear source. We'll have <coughs> epidemiologic <coughs> that ultrasonic testing has shown there are 1,000 holes or cavities of half a centimeter in diameter. We will have our featured interviews in just a moment. But first, the nuclear web, the nuclear website hot seat. Nuclearhotseat.com under this episode number 242, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I start losing track after a while. Today is Thursday. No, it's not. We activists do love our four-legged friends. And while cats are known to usually keep their opinions to themselves, our dogs have statements they want to make, and they want to make them on the air. So the problem is sort of the Three Mile Island problem. I believe you have some familiarity with okay, Three Mile okay, Island. Okay, okay, yeah, okay. Take, take, take it back to Three Mile Island. You were being contradicted in the background. Somebody couldn't I'm wait s- to get their comments in. Uh, walking through um, x-ray machines at airports. Boy, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Stop yeah, it. For God. Bro, he's just an instigator. He's a crabby old man. <laughs> Not unlike the way I feel some days. <laughs> or me. Hang on, hang on one second. Sure. Let's stop. How would a person proceed if they wanted to participate with you? Oh, by the way, there are noises going on in the background. You know what? I'm so sorry. I was going to tell you. My dog just got into my recycling. Hold on a minute. <laughs> and, of course, there's my own little munchkin who is no angel when it comes to making her presence known while I'm recording, sometimes in ways that you can't quite hear, but trust me, I do. Activist shout-outs. And that's Munchkin. Instant karma. And Gigi Press reports, shut up, Munchkin, under this episode. Ugh, Munchkin. All of this coming up in just a few moments, except I have to re-record this because my dog just drank some water. Oh, come on, Munchie, do you have to eat your kibble now? I want to find out what you think would make the show better, more relevant, more consistent. Munchkin, no! The opinion of dogs has not been requested. But, of course, she'll offer it anyway. Activist shout-outs! I wish to acknowledge you, the people who have helped make Nuclear Hot Seat possible over the last five years. Joni Ray and Ms. Milky the Clown for handling nuclear hot seat videos on YouTube. For technical support and training, Richard Viasana, Scott Portsline, Dave Parrish, and Otonio Lujan. Blessings on the newly formed Tuesday Night Posting Brigade. I refuse to call you groupies as one of you requested. That has too many overtones for me from the 60s. These are the people who get the show up and out on Facebook on Tuesday nights and Wednesday mornings so that I don't get blocked for posting too many times. The group is headed by Tara Johnson Douglas and includes Robert Cherwick, Carla Figueroa, Mark Kronowitz, Sean Arklight, Jesse Hoagland, Susan Laurel, Vicki Hobbs Nelson, and the others who help post the show without credit and help get the show up and out in all the places it deserves to be. We would welcome your participation. Thanks to my syndicators and news aggregators, Julie Stan of UCY.TV, Patrick Wilson of Activate Media, Pierce Nahigian of Planet Experts, and the broadcast crew at WGRN-FM in Columbus, Ohio. To all my donors, sources, interviewees, friends, and owners of the shoulders I often cry on, as well as you, the listening audience, I truly could not do this without you. And if I have forgotten to acknowledge someone in this list, my apologies. It's a temporary glitch. Let me know. I'll add you in next week. Here's today's final thought. Hear that? It's the sound of a mountain stream in the middle of a national forest, filled with fresh snowmelt, rushing downhill to nourish the frozen land back to life. I just got back from my annual spring camping trip, where I go off-grid, offline, and into nature. 
I avoid campgrounds because there are two kinds of people who go camping. Those who want to get away from it all, and those who want to take it all with them. I used to backpack, and I still seek out places where I'm completely away from people, as far away as I can get. Munchkin, of course, is my steadfast companion. I go to the woods to remember why I'm in this nuclear battle. It's for the Earth, the planet, Gaia, Unchi, Shechina, Maya, the rock upon which we all stand, and that has supported life for millions of years. The impulse of this planet is towards life. If you don't think so, look at any sidewalk crack in the middle of a busy city. A little bit of dirt collects, and suddenly moss grows on it. Maybe a little weed. Always, always, the planet's default setting is for life. As I surround myself with nature, wild life, wild growing things, I experience peace and let my mind go where it will, forcing nothing. Waiting for something to come to me, if it will. This is where and how, five years ago, I got a very clear message. You will do your first podcast this Tuesday. And from that impulse to the following Tuesday to here, has been five years and counting of nuclear hot seat. To be honest, there are times I'd like to walk away from the burden of this show. The hours upon hours spent trolling Facebook for leads to stories, the endless email from lists I subscribe to for information both pro nuclear and anti nuclear, finding and scheduling the guest interviews, researching the interviewees, prepping the questions, post production editing. Some weeks, I just don't want to do it. And then I realize that I can't not do it. Something inside me says, this is what your life is all about. This is why you were born, and why everything that has happened to you happened. Somehow, by doing what you do now, a fate, a destiny, a life will be fulfilled, if only in forcing the nuclear industry to think multiple times before they dare to combine the words, no immediate danger ever again, or help grow people's vocabulary to include and understand the word numbnuts. Where is this going to lead? Beats me. Hopefully, I'll get to play a small part in the creation of a nuclear free world, the closure of every nuclear reactor on the planet, the dismantling of nuclear weapons arsenals, and the discovery of a new technology that will neutralize radiation so it will not poison all future generations. There's an episode of Robin Williams' early TV series, Mork and Mindy, where his alien character from the planet Orc talked about having had a spray back home called Nuke Be Gone, like air freshener that neutralized radiation. That'd be nice, wouldn't it? Where's Stanford University and MIT on that concept? Why aren't the billionaires putting up some of their lunch money to fund research to get us out of this nuclear pickle? What is it going to take to bring people to sanity about the insane technology that the world's being sold so that we can unite and force the nuclear pushers to stop what they're doing and clean up the mess they've already made? So what can my little podcast do to help bring about that enormous goal? David and Goliath doesn't do it justice. But then it occurs to me, at minimum, Nuclear Hot Seat gives me and others a forum to ask these questions and not watch people's eyes and brains glaze over. This is where I, this is where we, can engage the conversations with others who want to talk about it, too. And it is quite the global conversation. I've always thought there was a reason why the word numbers began with the word numb. So I'm just now learning how to get stats on the show. The first one, from syndicatorucy.tv, is a doozy. 
They did this for me last year for the first time. And in May alone of 2015, the nuclear hot seat episodes carried on UCY.TV had been downloaded in 58 countries on six continents. I don't think my jaw drop has recovered from that one yet. This year I had them do it again, and they reported that from May 11 to June 11 of 2016, Nuclear Hot Seat was not downloaded in 58 countries, but in 112. My little podcast. 112 countries. This blows my mind. There are only 196 countries in the world. And I have at least one listener each in Uzbekistan and Botswana. And there are four in Nepal. And this is information from just one syndicator. I still have to learn how to count iTunes, YouTube, and the hits on my website. So my numbers will keep going up. It is heartening. Humbling. Again, jaw-droppingly amazing, at least for me. And when I stop being overwhelmed, it gives me a sense of how needed Nuclear Hot Seat really is and that people around the world value it, wherever they are. So I'm here, and I'm planning to stay for the duration of this battle, however long that might be. If I wasn't, I'd still be up in that forest, where I felt the kind of peace I wish on you, on everyone. I wanted to stay. I really did. But I found myself understanding something. I do this work because I love life. We as a community love life and want to see it continue forever, unmolested by the nuclear menace. We who are aware must never desert that awareness and must carry it to new generations so they can continue the fight until we win. Yes, I would like to still be up in that forest, listening to a snowmelt stream, with my red-painted toes dangling in cold water, with bright sun glinting through the ancient redwoods, and my little dog perched atop a fallen log, standing guard over her herd. That would be me. It is so tempting. As Robert Frost wrote, The woods are lovely, dark and deep, but I have promises to keep, and miles to go before I sleep, and miles to go before I sleep. This show is my promise to you. This has been Nuclear Hot Seat number 260 for Tuesday, June 14, 2016. Material for this week's program has been researched and compiled from abc7.com, ecowatch.com, corporatecrimereporter.com, no nukes northwest, fukushimadiary.com, amc.9rg, ft.com, asahi.com, mainichi.jp, japantimes.co, dw.com, theguardian.com, deunrenard.wordpress.com, cndpindia.org, thetimes.co.uk, rdm.co.za, nzherald.co.nz, the sole dead PR flax and hacks of World Nuclear News, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, and the activist community of Nuclear Hot Seat. I love you all. If you haven't already, go to the Nuclear Hot Seat page on Facebook, the one with the logo, and check in there for lots of good news and people networking with each other. Theme music written by me, sung by Mary Lee Weber, accompaniment by John Barnard, recorded at Winslow Court Studio in Hollywood. Nuclear Hot Seat is syndicated by UCY.TV, ActivateMedia.org, PlanetExperts.com, on NewsZSentinel.com, and now broadcast on WGRN-FM. If you know of an online news aggregator or community radio station that would like to carry the show, send an email to info at nuclearhotseat.com. Dot com. Our archive of 260 shows is up on the website, nuclearhotseat.com. 
Much of this is on our YouTube channel under Nuclear Hot Seat Videos, and you can find them on iTunes under Podcasts. A reminder that it's your contributions that help keep Nuclear Hot Seat the vital force it is for honest, accurate nuclear news. So please, do what you can this week to help us out with a donation at NuclearHotSeat.com. Nuclear Hot Seat is the activist voice on nuclear issues. So if you have a story lead, a hot tip, or a suggestion of someone to interview, send an email to info at NuclearHotSeat.com. We are copyright 2016, Libby Halevi and Hardestry Communications. All rights reserved, but fair use allowed as long as proper attribution is provided. Going out now on some of the kind words of support I received for the show before we get to the final theme. This is Libby Halevi of Hardestry Communications, the heart of the art of communicating, reminding you it's five years down and how many more to go? Let's just take it one week at a time. As long as you remember that we have all had our nuclear wake-up call, now don't go back to sleep, because we are all in the nuclear hot seat. I thank you very much for what you're doing to communicate with the public and put the public in touch with people like me who otherwise they wouldn't be hearing so much from. So I appreciate that. I think you're doing a good service, and I've appreciated all the various conversations that I've had with you and the information that you're putting out. I am so grateful that you're producing Nuclear Hot Seat every single week for the past five years. It's a huge undertaking, and our community and our country are both better off for your being here. So thank you so much for doing this labor of love. Libby, we were just talking about dogs in our lives, and I need to just allow that you are like a dog on a bone when it comes to the nuclear industry and your creation of the nuclear hot seat so that so many people across this country can learn, can act, and can be joining you as dogs on the bone because this situation has to change, and it has to change for health. And it has to change for a viable future. And so you putting the nuclear industry in the hot seat is something I thank you for. Thank you so, so much. I am grateful for Nuclear Hot Seat being as wonderful a newscast as it is for all of us who are working so hard at shutting down the nuclear power regime that we have around the world. This is the most crucial show that we have anywhere. And for this show to have lasted for five years and taken off and become the most incredible news source for all things nuclear, I'm grateful. I'm impressed. I'm proud. Thank you so much, Libby, for bringing us your talent and this platform to get our messages out to the world. I've really appreciated Nuclear Hot Seat for the past five years. And one highlight of that was when Nuclear Hot Seat called in to the celebration of Vermont Yankees closure and talked to the grassroots activists around Vermont Yankee, some of whom have been fighting Vermont Yankee for four decades, it's fair to say. And so Nuclear Hot Seat is just on the cutting edge of what's going on in regards to nuclear power and radioactive waste even to the point of knowing when to show up at a very important celebration like that. So I just commend you for five years of good work. Look forward to uh, talking to you again and just keep it up. Keep it up. Thank you very much, Libby. I appreciate your interview. You're a very good interviewer. Thank you, Libby. Uh, it's a pleasure from mine and uh, well done. And uh, I hope that uh, we can certainly keep in touch. Thank you so much for five wonderful years of keeping the public informed and the way that you do that makes it enjoyable. I mean, it's kind of hard to include those two words when you're talking about nuclear, but you do. You keep us informed in a way that one can listen, learn information. Thank you so much. Your programs are excellent. Happy anniversary and many more. Nuclear hot seat. What are those people thinking? Nuclear hot seat. What have those boys been drinking? Nuclear hot seat. The corium is sinking. Our time to act is shrinking, but our activists are linking. Nuclear hot seat.
It's the bomb.